Goju-ryu is one of the most recognized forms of traditional karate. Translating to hard soft style, it holds deep roots in both Okinawan and Chinese martial arts. Now, regardless if you are a traditional martial artist or prefer the more contemporary styles of MMA, our goal for this episode is to leave you with at least a little bit of appreciation for the art and what makes it so distinct. This is the history of Goju-ryu karate. Celebrate the art of Goju-ryu Karate with this commemorative Forefather t-shirt, available only here at Art of One Dojo. Pick yours up on the product shelf below the video or at the link in the description. I would like to thank both the Goju-ryu philosopher and Sensei John Paul Williams for their help and guidance on this project. The Goju-ryu philosopher has a great YouTube channel that goes much more in depth on individual aspects and I highly recommend his videos to further elaborate on this topic. Sensei John Paul Williams has an extensive background and experience with the art and is a highly regarded authority on the subject and his new book, Goju-ryu Karate Do Desk Reference Volume 1, is now available and a definite recommended read. He will also be joining us next week as we discuss the efforts to preserve the art. Links to both of these gentlemen are listed below in the video description. Goju-ryu Karate translates to Heart Soft Style and it was formally founded by Okinawan master Miyagi Chojin Sensei in the 1930s. The name refers to the nature of the art having both hard and soft techniques. The word go, or hard, is generally in reference to the close hand techniques in the application of linear moves and hard strikes. Ju, or soft, sometimes translated as gentle, refers to the circular motions that can ride or deviate attacks and are generally open-handed techniques. The combination of these two attributes is a common duality in the structure of the art. Now, while Miyagi Chojin is the founder of Goju-ryu officially, to appreciate its roots, we have to go back a little bit further to Higaona Kanryo, born in Nishimura, Naha in 1853, back when Okinawa was still a part of the Ryukyu Kingdom. We did an episode on the birth of karate in Okinawa and the Ryukyu Kingdom in our episode, What Does Karate?, that elaborates on that a little bit more, and we have linked that below as well. During this time in history, there were established trade routes between China and Okinawa, and Higa Ona Kanryo was born into a family of merchants shipping goods between the islands of the kingdom. He learned the value of working hard, and through labor was able to develop and build physical strength. At the young age of about 14, Higa Ona Kanryo began training in the martial arts. It is generally believed that he began his training under the influence and tutelage of Arakaki Seisho in the art of monk fist boxing, and specifically the Chinese arts. However, Greater doubt is being cast on this concept as more research is being conducted. For example, the names of the kata taught by Arakaki were uniquely Okinawan, and like most boys in Okinawa at the time, Arakaki began his training at home using local or native Okinawan utensils. With the total time spent in China by Arakaki, we cannot logically conclude that he would have had enough time to have mastered any form of monk fist boxing, and it is also known now that there was much more focus on philosophy, politics, and his education during his time in China. Wishing to improve on his martial arts training, he got on to travel to Fuzhou, China, where he was said to have studied several different Chinese arts. Now, there is often dispute as to which arts exactly he trained in and who he trained under, but there is no question that he was able to expand on his education, and he came back to Okinawa in the 1880s and opened up his first martial arts school in Naha in 1905. It is also believed that Higaona was allowed to have access to the Bubishi, which is a highly regarded Chinese text that is often considered the Bible of Karate. As fighting arts became established in Okinawa, the term turi was often used, which translates to tang hand. The word te, or hand, was also commonly used. Local systems developed in various cities of Okinawa, and at this time it was traditional to name the fighting style after the region it developed in. The three most prominent of these arts were nahate, shurite, and tomarite, named respectively out of their cities of origin. These names were officially agreed upon and recognized in 1926. Higa Ona Kanryo is credited, sometimes along with his teacher Arakaki Seisho, for establishing Nahate, implementing a combination of the Chinese arts he learned along with the developing systems in Okinawa. Higa Ona Sensei is a significant figure in the early development of karate, and during his years of teaching he had several prominent students, including Shito Ryo founder Mabuni Kenwa, Tuun Ryu founder Juhatsu Kyoda, and eventual Goju Ryu founder Miyagi Chojin. If you really think a little further or deeper into the style, Kanryo Higa Ona was more, if not equally, the founder of Goju-ryu. Uh, Miyagi-sensei named Goju-ryu. Before Miyagi-sensei, it was just called Te. But 
the person who introduced goju and brought those styles or brought those kata into a more modern uh, use and spread it. That was Higiona. Miyagi then, of course, added a few kata, the rest of the kata he got from this teacher. So both are considered the founder of Goju-ryu. Miyagi a bit more so, but Higiona a bit more important. Miyagi Chojin was born in Naha, Okinawa on April 25th, 1888, while Okinawa was under the Empire of Japan. He was raised in an upper-class family and took an interest in the martial arts, beginning his training at age 11 in the Okinawan arts under instructor Aragaki Ryuko. In 1902, at age 14, Miyagi began to train under Higaona Kanryo and became one of his most prominent students. There are some accounts that say Miyagi dedicated his time to Higaona, cleaning the school, and possibly becoming an Uchideshi or live-in student. Miyagi trained under Higaona in the style of Nahate from 1902 until Higaona's death in 1915, with his training only interrupted by a tour of duty in the military from 1910 to 1912. Becoming an authoritative figure in the martial arts in his own right, Miyagi followed a similar path as his teacher, traveling to China to expand on his training and bringing back Chinese combat influences. He traveled to Fujian province in China with Go Genki, his friend and interpreter, and they continued his research. Much like Higa Ona Kanryo, Miyagi returned to Okinawa and blended his new education with what he had learned in Nahate, which was the beginning foundation to his own art that would later be referred to as Goju-ru. An example of this is a kata known as Rokishu, also known as Six Hands. Miyagi did not retain this form in its native format, but he instead used it as the basis to create the Goju-ru kata of Tensho. In fact, Miyagi developed several kata for his system that to this day form the basic core of the curriculum. Now this is important because if you're one of those people who hate kata and feel that it serves no purpose, I believe that even you will be able to appreciate some of the thought behind it. So stick with us because we're going to elaborate on this in a few minutes. Upon his return from China, Miyagi Chojin also opened up his own dojo and in 1918 he founded the Karate Research Society. In this new society, he brought in some of the most prominent martial artists at the time in an attempt to combine the education of other prominent karate masters. Miyagi also became friends with other notable Japanese martial artists such as Funakoshi Ginchin and Kano Jigoro, founders of Shotokan and Judo respectively. How did the art of Goju-ru become named as such? While it seems anecdotal and details of the account differ slightly, there is a generally accepted story of how the art gained its name. In 1929, there was a large martial arts exhibition being held in Kyoto, Japan, called the All Japan Martial Arts Demonstration. Many founders and prominent masters were invited to showcase their arts. It is said that Miyagi Chojin was unable to attend the event and instead sent one of his students, Shinzato Jinan, to go in his place. Also during this time, in Japan, was an attempt to categorize and organize martial arts styles and many were registered with the Dainippon Butokukai or Greater Japan Martial Virtue Society. After the demonstration, Shinzato was approached and asked what style of karate he was practicing. At this juncture in the art's history, an official name had not yet been given and it was said that Shinzato didn't have an answer. Some accounts report that being put on the spot and not wanting to be humiliated, he called it Hanko Ryu or Half Hard Style. Upon returning back to Okinawa, he recounted his experience to Miyagi, who molded over and decided to refer to a poem written in the Bubishi ancient text. He drew from the 13th article a poem called Haku Kempo, or The Eight Laws of the Fist. In that poem is the line, the law of inhaling and exhaling is hard and soft. Miyagi liked this reference as it reflected one of the core focuses of his art, the importance of breathing and the principles of using both hard and soft techniques. It was from here that he derived the name Goju-ru for hard soft style and it was said that he was the first to register the name of his art with the Dai Nippon Butokukai. Goju-ru began to proliferate from here with Miyagi taking on notable students, many of whom would become influential figures in the evolution and spread of the art. Miyagi also began teaching in schools as well as the Okinawan Police Department and in 1934 he wrote The Outline of Karate Do. This is said to be one of his only surviving written works. He spent his time growing the art and traveling and was awarded several teaching titles from the Dainippon Butokukai. Miyagi had firmly established a strong foundation and was on a path for success. Unfortunately, as with many things, life got in the way. From 1939 until 1945, World War II rattled the globe. Spanning across both the European and Pacific theaters, the war left behind a trail of death and destruction, ravaging many nations in the process. Okinawa was no exception. From March through July 1945, the Battle of Okinawa pummeled the island nation in a 98-day campaign. 
Okinawa was the unfortunate recipient of a head-on conflict between the Empire of Japan and the advancing American forces. The United States Armed Forces were capturing islands and were eyeing and landing on the small nation to prepare for a ground invasion of the Japanese mainland. Now Japan mounted a massive counter and Okinawa found itself bombed and destroyed in an attempt to prevent the United States from getting a foothold. These campaigns were conducted with little to no consideration of civilian casualties and as a result the Battle of Okinawa was one of the most devastating and bloodiest battles of the Pacific Theater. According to Britannica.com, the battle claimed 12,000 American lives, 100,000 Japanese, and at least 100,000 Okinawan citizens. Other sources report up to a possible 150,000 dead or missing Okinawans, which was half of the standing population before the war. In the end, the United States was able to secure the island and was preparing for the invasion. However, due to the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945, Japan surrendered and the war was over negating the efforts of taking Okinawa and the casualties that it incurred. Miyagi Chojin survived the destruction, but his home was left in ruins and he lost a number of relatives, including some of his children, as well as his close friend and student, Shinzato Jinan. When the war ended and Okinawa was under U.S. occupation, Miyagi Chojin was permitted to reopen his garden dojo. For the remainder of his life, Miyagi continued to teach at his dojo and at the police academy, but it was said that he was never the same again, having lost so much in the war. There was a heavy heart and there's pictures of Miyagi again, that you could see a, a happy, smiling Miyagi at one time in his life. And after the war, it's almost a forced smile. And that is in very few photos where you can actually see a man who's been through war. It's obvious there was a lot of heartache and suffering that he went through. But previous to that, he's, a lot of the pictures, he's a chubby little boy. <laughs> had some weight on his face there there's a clear difference we have to we have to face that and give him credit for what he was able to still pass down on october 8th 1953 miyagi chojin passed away at the age of 65 leaving behind a solid legacy that would become a pillar in karate and a roster of master students and allies that would help the art spread throughout the world As with what happens in many martial arts when the founder passes away unexpectedly, Miyagi Chojin did not name an official successor. Now, while there were claims and conjecture, without the official declaration of a successor, Gojiru divided into different branches as it began to propagate throughout the world. Now, each one of these masters surely deserve an episode on their own, as their contributions to the art cannot truly be summarized in just a few minutes. However, I do want to give them an honorable mention as they had a pivotal place in history. The first is Shinzato Jinan. We can recall his experience at the All Japan Martial Arts Demonstration and his consultation with Miyagi Chojin to designate a registered name for the art. Shinzato was said to be one of Miyagi's most trusted students. He was born in Naha in 1901 and he was a sick and weakly child, but through the training in the martial arts, he was able to build up his health and strength. He trained with Miyagi for several years, often accompanied him on trips, and he was one of only three people to get Miyagi's approval to open up his own dojo. He also trained in Judo, was a member of the Okinawan police force, as were many Okinawan masters, and even received the title of Renshi, or Polish teacher, from the Dai Nippon Butokukai. He contributed greatly to the spread and development of Gojiru, and served in the military and fought in World War II during the Battle of Okinawa, where he was killed at the age of 44 in a bombing campaign. It is a common narrative that Shinzato was to be named Miyagi's successor, if not for his untimely death. However, there has been no official confirmation of that, and it remains conjecture to this day. I do believe Shinzato was the successor. I believe this almost exclusively because he told his own son, Takeshi Miyagi, if anything were to happen to him, to contact Shinzato. Now, of course, Shinzato died also, and Takeshi, which most people call K, but that's that's not how you read his name. You read his, there's the kanji for his name, a lot of people, there's a big misconception, his name is K Miyagi, it's Takeshi. If you look at his own documentations, he puts here in hiragana in parentheses takeshi so that everybody makes sure that they have the correct wording or pronunciation for his kanji for his name k couldn't get home to okinawa in time for the funeral it's just impossible in 1953 to go from okinawa from, to, from mainland japan to okinawa by boats you're just not going to show up in in four days for a funeral so takeshi miyagi didn't could not go to his own father's funeral which is where this big hoopla of who the rightful leader is so today we just have to deal with the point of we have multiple organizations and none of the organizations i think should 
make claim over one or the other. They became the leaders of their organizations equally. And everybody really should just accept that because the old question of who the successor was is dead. Uh, and if they really want to make an argument of anything, the true successor should be Takeshi Miyagi, the oldest living son of Miyagi when he died. Just because he was couldn't make the funeral doesn't mean you count him out. Yamaguchi Jitsumi is a pinnacle figure in the history of Gojiru, if not a bit of a colorful character. He was born in 1909 in Kyushu, Japan, and began studying the martial arts at a young age. He was also experienced in swordsmanship, and while studying law at Ritsumi Khan University, he started the Ritsumi Khan Karate Research Society with friend and fellow martial artist Yogi Jitsui. Miyagi Chojin was invited to visit the school, and he accepted the invitation in 1931, and Miyagi made the first of a few known trips to the university where it is believed Yamaguchi trained with him directly. There is actually some controversy over Yamaguchi's given name. The name Jitsumi has been the widely believed name for many, many years. However, with deeper research within the family and translations, the name of Yoshimi may be more accurate. I'd like to credit John Paul Williams for this research, and this is just a sample of the level of detail you'll be able to find in this book. Being of small stature and sporting long, dark, flowing hair, he was sometimes called the Cat by American GIs. However, he was most notably known by his nickname of Gogen, meaning rough. He was also a strong nationalist very spiritual, and was captured by the USSR during World War II and spent two years as a POW from 1945 to 1947. There is a lot of controversy with much of Yamaguchi's claims throughout his life. It was said he often got into trouble and he had a habit of getting into altercations and he would recount stories of his victories against multiple attackers. One of his most debated claims, and the one he's most famous for, was declaring that Miyagi appointed him the true successor of Gojiru and tasked him with spreading the art throughout mainland Japan. Now, there are many who dispute this, mainly citing that Miyagi Chojin never publicly appointed anyone as successor, and there is skepticism that he would have appointed Gogen Yamaguchi over any of his long-standing Okinawan friends and students. Now, regardless of which of his claims may or may not be true, we can't overlook his contribution and impact on what was to become the future of Goju-ryu Karate. In 1950, he established the Goju Kai, which has become one of the most well-known Goju-ryu organizations in the world, represented by the Golden Fist Emblem. Through his teaching and networking, Yamaguchi was able to propagate Gojiru across not only all of Japan, but open the door for its journey to America as well. He is credited with his emphasis on freestyle sparring and karate, which may have helped shape the landscape for many of the competitions we see today. He helped establish the All Japan Karate Do Federation, also known as the JKF. Yamaguchi carries a heavy legacy within the art of Gojiru, and while smarter minds can debate which of his claims were true, he was able to elevate the art to a much broader global base. Upon his passing in 1989, Yamaguchi left the direction and administration of the Gojukai to his sons, Gosei, Gosen, and Goshi. Gosei, his eldest son, established and currently presides over the Gojukai Karate Do USA as Hanshi and Chief Instructor. There are several more influential figures in the art, and we'll revisit them later in this episode when we talk about the different organizations. Right now, let's explore the art of Gojuru itself and the distinct characteristics of this karate system. Many karate systems have overlapping concepts, techniques, and principles, so to the uninitiated, it can be hard to tell them apart. I personally love learning the smaller distinct features of each system because that's where all the heart and flavor of the arts come out. With Goju-ryu, let's start directly with the name, Hard Soft. This system imparts equal emphasis on being able to deliver hard linear techniques as well as softer circular moves. The idea here is to balance and being able to use one concept to counter the other. I'd like to refer to an excerpt from John Paul Williams' book that says, The system is based on the concept of hard and rigid is not good. However, completely soft and gentle can be equally harmful. The two should complement each other. This combination gives Gojiru its beauty, refined movements, grace, and flowing form. So it's really about this perfect tandem between the two methods that gives Gojiru its foundation. Another main core focus on the art is the importance of body conditioning and proper breathing technique. You can see a very conscious effort in deliberate breathing in Goju-ryu practice, specifically in the kata of Sanchin as well as Tensho. Proper breathing in these forms is intended to be isotonic and isometric and used to promote stronger lung capacity, better heart health, and improved body posture. Conditioning is another distinct characteristic of Goju-ryu. Now much of what Miyagi Chojin taught and implemented came directly from his teacher before him, Higa Ona Kanryo, so much of the foundation was already laid down. As Miyagi Chojin propagated this teaching, he was essentially teaching an updated and next-generation version of the art that he learned from Higa Ona. 
uh, the difference between Higiona and Miyagi was mostly uh, with the strength conditioning, uh, implement, implementation of Hojo Undu, the, uh, all the took tools. So M Miyagi also uh, put together a scientifically organized basic exercises and warm ups, Jumbi Undu, which didn't exist. Uh, there was basic warm ups and stretching with Higiona, but not scientifically organized. It changed with Miyagi. It became more of systematic. There are several notable differences between Okinawan and Japanese karate. Popular Japanese styles such as Shotokan are strong with driving linear power, generally have deeper stances, higher kicks, and explosive techniques that are implemented in competition. Okinawan karate tends to exhibit narrower stances, lower kicks, and closer range combat. We can see this in Goju-ru through the emphasis of close proximity fighting over ranged attacks. There's a lot of pulling, grabbing, tearing in this close contact, and it's often referred to as standing jujitsu or standing grappling. There are some accounts that suggest that Shinzato Jinan helped Miyagi define some of the grappling aspects of the art. He had an extensive judo background, he was personal friends with judo founder Kano Jigoro, and he was a close and trusted student of Miyagi, so it is reasonable to believe that he contributed to the development of the art. The Okinawan term of Muchimi translates to heavy sticky and is in reference to and closely related to kaki or pushing hands. The concept is that you want to be able to stick to your opponent. Once you make contact, you want to keep that contact in order to manipulate and control their body. It is the concept of eliminating gaps and seizing control and leveraging your opponent. We see this concept in a lot of grappling arts, BJJ, Judo, Kempo, Wrestling. Once you touch, you should be able to close your eyes and feel your way through the struggle. While there are many practices and attributes that make Gojuru as distinct as it is, we wouldn't be doing the art any justice if we didn't talk about Kata and the emphasis on Bunkai. Kata is often the point of contention in the martial arts. Most traditional disciplines have kata of some form, but a lot of contemporary schools and practitioners tend to disregard it as impractical or unnecessary. Now, even though kata is not an exclusive concept to Goju-ru, I think the way that it is processed and approached has a lot of value to it and can, at the very least, establish an appreciation of how kata came to be and the purpose it serves. To appreciate kata, we need to understand why and how they were developed to begin with. In the early days of karate, students worked many partner drills with each other. These were often sparring sequences taught in an attack and counter formations, very similar to a BJJ class in which you would learn a counter to a takedown or a reversal from an attempted submission. Attack and defense sequences. These were work in class with a partner, but part of the training is to be able to review and practice the material on your own time. But imagine an era in which students did not have access to handbooks or printouts or reference videos or, imagine the horror, the internet. So it was common to string a lot of these attack and defense sequences together into longer sequences, typically organized thematically. These sequences were an easy way for the students to memorize a particular set of drills so that they could study and practice on their own. In essence, these sequences were simply textbooks or reference manuals written in motion. So as a modern example, imagine your MMA coach showed you five different takedown counters, but put them together in a string in an ordered sequence as an easy way to remember them and practice them on your own. It wouldn't be just a dance, but rather actual academic information that you could use as a reference and study tool. So over time, these sequences would be adjusted, altered, and passed down to more students, establishing the essence of kata. The problem is, kata doesn't mean anything if you don't understand what the movements represent. To make the deciphering process even more difficult, since those sequences were to help the students memorize their own defensive movements, the attacking portions of the drills were not included, so these sequences essentially only contained half the information. One of Miyagi's closer students, Tokuchi Sakichi, dedicated a lot of focus on exactly this, understanding and preserving the concepts taught. The challenge, however, is that it was believed that over time, these sequences were altered and abbreviated, and the meaning wasn't always passed down correctly or withheld to exclusive students or mistranslated over time. Long kata sequences often required a lot of space to work, so it is believed that many of them were pared down to make them easier to memorize, but students got used to memorizing the motions and forgot, or never learned, what the original movements were teaching. Couple in the possibility that teachers may have withheld some translations or altered forms to denote lineage, and you wind up with a sequence that has lost a lot of its original value. The practice of bunkai, which means separating or pulling apart, is a method of studying kata and breaking the motions down in an attempt to reconstruct what the original sequences might have been teaching and extract the practical combat information within it. Toguchi approached this challenge in a very methodical way. He heavily endorsed an analytical process Miyagi taught him called Kasai no Genri. This was a general set of rules and guidelines used in an effort to unlock some of those secrets when applying bunkai to a kata. 
By using this list of guidelines, Toguchi felt that the extracted moves needed to be pressure tested so those sections of the kata were then put back into partner drills called Bunkai Kumite and tested over and over to see if the analysis held up. Basically, reverse engineering the kata back to its original attack defense steps. There are three main principles and several supplemental rules to follow when analyzing the kata. The three main principles are, one, don't be deceived by Ambusen or the directional path used in the kata. Many kata were redesigned at some point to be practiced in smaller spaces, so often footwork was abbreviated or directional changes were added. Two, techniques executed while advancing imply attacking moves, while techniques performed while retreating imply defensive maneuvers. Three, there is only one enemy and he is in front of you. If the kata has you turned to face a different direction, it does not imply a second opponent. Toguchi added the following advanced rules to break down the analysis even further. One, every movement in kata has a fighting application. Two, a hand returning to a closed position usually has something in it. Three, utilize the shortest distance to your opponent. Four, if you control your opponent's head, you control your opponent. Five, there are no blocks. This implies that techniques that appear to be blocks are likely throwing or grabbing techniques. Six, angles in kata are important. Seven, touching your own body indicated that you are touching part of your opponent. Eight, don't attack hard targets on your opponent with hard parts of your body. Nine, there are no pauses in application. Now these are, of course, just general guidelines and there's no guarantee that the interpretations are 100% correct, but it is an ongoing effort and a very important part of kata study to not only preserve history, but to make kata a more powerful training tool in karate. While different Goju-ryu schools may vary in the kata they teach, there's a general set of core kata taught and each one covers a very specific theme or purpose. For example, we've already mentioned Sanshin and the emphasis it has on breathing. Translating to three battles, the goal of Sanchin's focus and breathing patterns is to unite the body, mind, and spirit. Sanchin is also considered the harder focus, so its softer counterpart is Tensho, meaning revolving hands, concentrating on tension and soft flowing hand movements. Seiyunshin is a kata that incorporates tactics to grapple by grabbing and pulling your opponent off balance. It was the featured kata in the Karate Kid Part 3, although it is widely considered an inaccurate depiction of the form. Shisochin, meaning fight in four directions, which incorporates linear attacks and circular blocks. We catch a very quick glimpse of this form again in the Karate Kid films, this time Miyagi himself performing it in part two. There are also promotional kata that were developed for demonstration and promotional purposes. These were not standardized kata to be implemented into the curriculum, but rather used to introduce children to some of the basic concepts and physical education taught in Gojuru. We could spend an entire episode breaking down more kata, but this is just a sample of how much focus and education goes into the bunkai of the Goju-ryu kata and has become one of the signatures of the system. Goju-ryu also features the Okinawan weapons arts, or kobudo, which typically sees the inclusions of weapons such as the bow, sai, nonchuku, three-sectional staff, tonfa, and several others. Freestyle fighting also became integrated with the art, with a heavy effort from Gogen Yamaguchi and the Japanese influence of competitive fighting. And speaking of Japanese influences, while Goju-ryu is Okinawan in origin, as it spread throughout the world and experienced a degree of, you know, deviation and variation, and John Paul Williams gives us a little bit of insight on some of the differences seen in Japanese and Okinawan Goju-ryu. Uh, Okinawa Goju-ryu and Japanese Goju-ryu follow the same styles of kata and pattern, but not necessarily the same types of kumite. Japanese Goju-ryu uh, has a lot more focus on competition kumite on speed uh, versus all the power on literally budo. Whereas Okinawa Gojuru usually has more focus on bujitsu. So protection of one's body and building the body. Whereas in Japanese Gojuru, it's more of building the mind and building the individual. They're supposed to meet at one, at one location. But if, if you went to two different dojo, one Japanese, and one from Okinawa. The Japanese dojo, you'll note clearly, they probably have a lot more kumite going. The Okinawa goju-ru, you'll note that it clearly has more kata work going on. The kata in the Okinawa goju-ru dojo will seem heavier and more rooted and deep and solid. Whereas the Japanese goju-ru will seem more shito-ru, a, a bit more flair, a bit more uh, flavor. As of right now, the two are marrying back together again. And that's mostly through the JKF Gojukai. And the JKF Gojukai is heavily influenced by the Okinawa Gojuru Kyokai, Oji KK. And the Japanese dojo in Japan are now taking that heavy influence of Oji KK and Gojuru from Okinawa and recognizing that all karate is from Okinawa. So they're getting the depth of that Okinawan knowledge 
and they're using the sport that they've already built up on their own and combining the two. So it's Goju now is becoming better. The difference and but it's also coming back together to where it's supposed to be. As Goju spread across the world, many organizations were established to represent, preserve, and sometimes grow the art. As is the case with most martial arts, each organization has their own flavor and philosophy behind it. Let's take a look at some of the more notable and larger organizations and see how Goju exists in today's landscape. The International Karate Do Goju Kai Association, or the IKGA, is an organization founded by Gogen Yamaguchi in order to represent and spread his version of the art. It is sometimes called Yamaguchi Goju Kai, and its reach has spanned over 60 countries since its establishment in 1965. Goju Kai strives to teach a traditional and balanced version of the art, keeping intact the breathing, conditioning, and spiritual aspects. The insignia of the Goju Kai is perhaps one of the most striking and recognizable symbols in traditional karate. A gold fist clenched tightly and said to be modeled after Miyagi Chojin's right hand is worn on the left lapel. This emblem is also widely present in other iterations of Goju Kai organizations around the world. Today, the Goju Kai is governed by Gogen Yamaguchi's third son, Goshi Yamaguchi. The International Okinawan Goju-Ryu Karate Do Federation, or IOGKF, claims the title of the largest traditional Okinawan Karate Association in the world. The organization touts a roster of more than 75,000 members and strives to preserve the integrity of traditional Okinawan Goju-Ryu as a cultural treasure of Okinawa. It was founded in 1979 by Master Higaona Morio, no relation to Higaona Kanryo. Higaona Morio, a 10th Don in the art and one of the most respected Goju-Ryu Karateka today, has a direct lineage to the roots of the art, and within the organization, he is recognized as the successor of Goju-Ryu. The IOGKF is currently headed by Sensei Nakamura Tetsuji. However, Sensei Higaona Morio still offers advisory support to the Federation. The emblem of the IOGKF is called the Kenkon and was designed to represent the symbolism embedded in the heart of Goju-Ryu. Consisting of both square and circular designs, the Kenkon represents the duality of hard, soft nature of the art. The circle stands for the soft aspects and the block stands for the hard. The name Kenkon means heaven and earth, again demonstrating the dual nature. The flowing circle is the heaven that surrounds the hard earth. The block design itself is Miyagi Chojin's family crest. The International Meibukan Goju-Ryu Karate Do Association, or IMGKA, was established by Grandmaster Hyagi Meitoku, a direct student of Grandmaster Miyagi Chojin. Meitoku trained with his master from 1926 to Miyagi's death in 1953. According to the IMGKA website, Miyagi was impressed at his aptitude for the material and dedication to learning the art, and Meitoku became the only student to learn all of the system's kata directly from the founder. Upon the passing of Miyagi Chojin, Meitoku opened up his school and named it Meibukan, which translates to House of the Pure-Minded Warrior. Meitoku continued to teach his Meibukan Goju-Ryu Karate globally until his death in 2003. Leadership of the IMGKA was picked up by his eldest son, Yagi Metatsu, who had trained under his father for more than 50 years. He continued his teaching of Meibukan Goju-Ryu and recently passed down the reins to his own sons. Since Yagi Meitoku was a well-known figure in the art during his training, he was known for hand strength and was also known as the Makiwara Breaker. He created five of his own kata unique to his Meibukan style and in 1986 was named a national treasure. The crest also sports the same message of duality that is common throughout the art. The logo represents the sun and the moon. The sun is thick and constant, the moon is slender and flexible. This expresses the hardness and the softness of Goju-Ryu. Additionally, an excerpt from their site explains part of the name. It reads that Mei of Meibukan correlates to the Karateka's overall character and personality, pure, clear-minded, having a good heart. The kanji Mei also appears in all of the men's names of the Yagi family. A young Miyazato Eiichi began training in the martial arts under his father, who was a direct student of Higaona Kanryo. This opened the door for him to really start his training early in Goju-Ryu directly under Miyagi Chojin. Miyazato became a dedicated student, and with the exception of World War II and the disruption it brought to Okinawa, he remained under the master's tutelage until Miyagi passed away. At this time of his passing, Miyagi's family had chosen Miyazato to take up the reins and continue his teaching at Miyagi's home garden dojo. It is even said that he inherited Miyagi's dogian belt. He was also an experienced judoka, and he heavily encouraged cross-training in the martial arts. 
1957, Miyazato opened his own dojo called the Jundokan in Naha City, Okinawa, and it was later rebuilt in concrete where it still stands today. The dojo consists of three floors, with the top floor serving as the Miyazato residence. The website, Jundokan New Zealand, gives an explanation of the name. The name Jundokan is sometimes translated as place to follow in footsteps. However, that is not exactly correct. It is, in fact, a unique play on two concepts important to Miyazato. Firstly, the first character, Jun, is the same character in the name Chojun, as in Miyagi Chojun Sensei, the founder of Gojiru Karate. But Jun can also mean obedience, order, and justice. Thus, the name Junokan can mean either the house of the path of Chojun or the house of the path of obedience, a sign of Miyazato's dedication to his teacher. Higaseka was a great contributor and practitioner of Goju-ru. He originally started training alongside Miyagi Chojin under Higaona Kanryo. However, he was only under Higaona's tutelage for a few years before the master's passing. Afterwards, he continued his karate education under Miyagi himself. Higaseko served as a police officer for many years before retiring in 1931 and decided to teach karate. He opened a dojo in his own home and he was one of the few students permitted to open their own dojo during Miyagi's lifetime. The dojo itself became known as the Shodokan and has since developed into its own organization, Shodokan Gojuru Karate Association. The name very roughly translates to Respect the Way School, and they strive to continue teaching and preserving traditional Gojuru and instilling respect, discipline, and life skills among all students. Shorei Khan is a school and organization founded by Master Toguchi Sekichi. Now we spoke about Toguchi earlier and his efforts in Kasai no Genri, a systematic approach to breaking down and reverse engineering the bunkai of traditional Goju Kata. Now according to their website, the Shorei Khan school was established to provide a system in which the student could make systematic progress in learning how to perform the very sophisticated art of Goju in his effort to teach kata at basic level, Toguchi formulated several entry-level kata unique to his system to help students transition into the process of bunkai and practicing gojuru. After Miyagi's passing, Toguchi set up his own school near the Kadena Air Force Base in Okinawa, teaching American airmen karate. Now, I personally believe that Toguchi was the inspiration of the character of Sato in The Karate Kid Part 2. In the film, Sato, having been a student of Mr. Miyagi's father, opened up a dojo in Kadena Air Force Base and taught karate to the airmen stationed there. This link is even more evident when you consider that Sato's last name is Toguchi. Shorei Khan has had its own growth and evolution as well. After Toguchi, the organization was overseen by Master Toshio Tamano, and as another excerpt from the website says, Shorei Khan Karate is for the people who wish to learn self-defense techniques and to improve physical and mental conditions. As Master Tamano wished to distinguish it from ordinary karate, he changed the name Shorei Khan Karate to Shorei Khan Okinawan Budo Kasai. USA Goju Karate is an offshoot of the Goju Kai organization established by Gogen Yamaguchi. It was founded by Peter Urban, who, according to their website and Kick Illustrated magazine, is sometimes referred to as the George Washington of American Karate. In 1953, Peter Urban became a student and apprentice of American martial artist Richard Kim and transitioned into an Uchideshi, or living student. Urban was working for the intelligence division of the Navy and a year later was transferred from Yokohama to Tokyo. Unable to continue his training with Kim, Kim introduced him to Kyokushin founder Masoyama and Gogen Yamaguchi. Now this was an extremely rare turn of events as non-Japanese were not usually accepted as students, making Urban one of the first American practitioners of Goju-ru. After training with Yamaguchi under Goju-kai for a few years and earning his black belt, Urban returned back home to the United States. Now, the origin of USA Goju Karate is controversial and a hot topic, but to summarize, Urban wished to continue teaching his art in America, and he wished to establish an American branch of Goju-ru. In 1963, he had traveled back to Japan to seek this blessing of Yamaguchi, as well as to seek promotion to Sixth Degree Black Belt. Well, to Urban's surprise, Yamaguchi refused and did not give his consent. After a falling out between the two men, Urban sought out his previous teacher, Richard Kim, obtained his rank, and went on to establish his American brand of the art anyway. Despite the controversy or bad blood involved, Urban succeeded in getting a foothold and through the USA Goju Karate, he helped propagate the art of Goju-ru throughout America. Sewakai is an international organization that has formed a huge network of Goju-ru schools, hundreds of them around the world. This network spawned from the original Sewakai school established in 1972 in Tokyo by Hanshi Tasaki Suji. 
This organization has grown to many international branches, including Sewakai Karate of Silicon Valley, which is a nonprofit organization formed in 2018 by John Paul Williams. SKSV not only works to preserve the art of Gojuru as taught by Miyagi Chojin, but it also serves as a pillar of support for a network of Gojuru schools that often face hardships and challenges of staying open. There are more organizations and associations, but this brief list should at least give an idea of just how popular, influential, and how widespread the art of Gojuru really is. With roots going back to original karate systems in Okinawa, Gojuru has persevered throughout time and remains a pillar in the martial arts community. It is a living art, and it continues to carry the torch of the light that Miyagi Chojin and Higa Ona Kanryo once carried. Its influence has also found its way as a component in other arts, such as Kyokushin and Ishinru. It has even found its way into media, such as the Karate Kid franchise, serving as the base art for the fictional Mr. Miyagi. There is so much more information on the history of Gojuru, especially the numerous masters who carried it. Our goal for today was to lift the veil and provide an introduction to those who are not familiar with the art, as well as a nod of appreciation to those who practice it and keep it alive today. I highly encourage everyone to visit the Gojuru Philosopher on YouTube for more detailed accounts on the masters, and also be sure to pick up John Paul Williams' book, Gojuru Karate Do Desk Reference Volume 1. In this book, you will find arguably the most historically accurate chronology of the art to date. I offer my extreme thanks to both gentlemen for their help with this project. Now come back and visit us next week as we talk with John Paul Williams in a new episode about the efforts of preserving Gojuru Karate. Thank you so much for watching, and don't forget to grab your own Art of One Dojo exclusive Gojuru t-shirt. You'll find a link for everything below in the video description.